Good morning to everybody. So today we're starting a new series. I've talked about it last uh, time I preached on the book of Hosea. So I'm going back to doing some expositional preaching. And I don't know how far into the book we're going to get. If you remember when I talked about this, I just felt like God wanted me to preach on the book of Hosea. And I have no idea where he's taken me in this. So you guys are along for the ride in my journey. But as I read this book in Hosea, what I've gathered, and I've read it before, and to me it's such a challenging book. It really is. Uh, I, you just see this incomprehensible love. And it's a love where grace and law actually collide. In the days of Hosea, they, they lived under the law. And so the law allowed certain things and didn't allow other things. And yet, in the midst of God's love, you see grace and law actually collide to where God's love breaks down boundaries and surpasses even the law. Where there's things that we think that should have happened because of God's law, God will even go beyond with his love. Like there's, there's a mix in the mess of his love for humanity, but it's a perfect love. And though I, I preached on this the last time I preached a couple weeks ago on an out-of-place love, I just really feel like this is where God's taking us for the next few weeks in the month of August, is we are going to be saturated in love. And so, if you don't like the topic of love, uh, I would say you probably don't want to be here, but you probably need to be here. And... Uh, and it's just going to be, I, I'm going to be going through several verses. You're going to hear them time and again. And I really feel like God's just impressing upon me to expand our love, to challenge our love, to stretch our love, um, to just get a greater revelation of his love inside of us. So my prayer is, no matter what I say, that God's doing in something inside of your hearts to have this greater understanding. And, and I, when I think about his word... You know, there's some things, like I've said before, that should probably be talked about a lot more often. And love is one of those things that should be talked about more frequently. If you really think about it, the Bible says faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love, right? And it's not just the greatest of the three topics. Like, you know, here's three topics that you guys need to pay attention to today. And love is the greatest of the three topics. No, the idea is that when it comes to faith, you know what faith is. And I, and I don't want to start preaching that. You know what hope is. And you know what love is. Or you should know, uh, have some sort of understanding of it. That of the idea of faith throughout the entire Bible. And the idea of hope throughout the entire Bible. When it comes to these three, that love is ultimately the greatest. And it's not just of the three topics, but it's of the entire Bible. Like literally, when you look at the Bible, it is really all about love. When it comes to the gifts of the Spirit versus the fruit of the Spirit, what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians? He says that love trumps all. Like love is greater than all. He says in Romans that love conquers all. You know, that when it comes to people flowing in the gifts of the Spirit, that's what God wants. But the reality is if there is no love behind it, you're nothing but a, a clanging symbol, right? That it all comes back to love. And, and God's entire word is a love story. His love for humanity, his love for you and I. It is the greatest topic in all of the Bible. And if it's that great, if it's the most important aspect of, of who God is, then it should be something that we all understand, that we get inside of us, that we are growing in continually. And when you look at the idea of love throughout the world, you'll know that it's convoluted that, that, that when it comes to love, it's so distorted in the world. And as Christians, we know that love in the world is distorted, and yet we ourselves struggle with those same distractions, with those same distortions. Like, we know what it is, and we look at maybe the extreme examples of love as being distorted, but the reality is we were born into this culture, and we've been influenced by this culture, and when it comes to biblical love, more than likely, it's a great challenge for most Christians to live in biblical love. To really understand the gut love that God has for us and what he expects us to have towards others is a complete challenge to most Christians. And yet, it's what we should be continually growing in. Like, what does God's love 
really look like? It, is it a feeling? Is it a choice? Or, or can it be both? When it comes to loving people, do we really love people like God wants us to love people? Or are we sometimes a little uncaring? Are we a little unconsiderate, inconsiderate? Are we a little selfish in our love? We don't really want to put ourselves out there. Maybe we don't want to share certain aspects like that. When it comes to love, isn't love about speaking the truth in love? Or can you be too loving? Do you have to be a, a doormat or is there balance? And if there is balance, then what is that balance? Is love fair? Is love just? When it, when it comes to love, do we really comprehend the love of God? You know, I think about singing the last song that we sang. And we didn't purpose that, but that song blows my mind when I sit there and sing it. And the more I sing it, the more I know that song. Sometimes going down the road, I just begin to sing it because it's so mind-blowing to know God's love for me. But do we really comprehend it? And that's what Paul says if you go back to Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. He says that he's praying that Christ may dwell in your heart. Say, my heart. He's praying that Christ would dwell in your heart through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height, that you may be able to comprehend the width, the depth, the length, the height of God's love. The goal is to be able to comprehend it. That's what he's saying. That's our goal. That's the target. That's what's in front of us. There should be this desire in us. There should be this growth in us of, of comprehending the vastness of God's love. In verse 19, he says, To know the love of Christ, for us to know his love that passes knowledge. Like for us to understand that there's this love that passes all knowledge. It's a vast love, but we're to have a knowledge of the vastness of that love. And though we may never fully understand it, know it, or comprehend it, we're continually digging in it and learning more about it. And the thing with God's love is that he knows just coming from him that it's difficult for us to understand. So what does God do? It's the story of the Bible. He gives us examples throughout humanity to help us better relate to who he is. And when it comes to his love, I, I just was thinking about some of these examples. Genesis chapter 22, you see the story of Abraham and Isaac, right? And if you know the story, most of you probably do, you have Abraham who's a man, and in, um, a man in his time frame, in his culture, in order to be blessed of God and look at as being blessed by God, would be to have many children, would be to be fruitful. And for a man, it would be to also have many sons that he would pass in his inheritance onto. And so to think that that was more than likely the heart of Abraham for most of his life, and yet his wife is barren, and so he's struggles with this dream, with this vision, with this cultural mentality of who he is and his vitality. And, and yet at 75 years old that God would visit him and tell him, you're going to have a son. I'm going to change your name from Abram to Abraham and you're going to be the father of many nations. And, and so Abraham receives that promise into his life. And now because God spoke to him about where his, his future lies, about what's going to take place, then Abraham now has a dream. He has a hope. And, and if you can imagine that one thing that he thought he would never have in life, God saying, no, I'm going to give it to you, that he began to dream that dream, that he began to think about it. Imagine what his son might look like when he is born, how he would be when he grows up. The things that Abraham would teach him and what he would do with him and the love of God and the importance of his ways and Abraham being successful in business would teach him all about the business and have somebody to pass that business on to. And so I imagine that after God had spoke to him, right away he begins to dream the dream. And yet after a year, he still has no son. And after another year, he still has no son. And another year, he still has no son. We're talking one year, two year, three year, four year, five year, six year, seven year, eight year, nine year, ten years down the road. Abraham still isn't seeing God's promise come to pass in his life. But God, this is what your word says. This is what I felt like you spoke to me. And did, maybe I misheard you. Maybe I, I misunderstood. Maybe it was a dream. I just, I can imagine him struggling 
over the thought that I had these dreams and they don't seem to be working out. God, where are you in what you told me you would do in my life? And it goes on to the 11th year, the 12th year, 13, 14, 15 years. Like how long are you going to wait to see this come to pass in your life? Because you're only getting older and life isn't getting any easier. And then he goes 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 years into this. God, where are you? This is the dream. And now that dream is beginning to shrivel. But 25 years down, he's 100 years old. When it looks impossible that it could ever come come to pass, then God gives him his son. And imagine throughout all of the waiting, the, the nearing the loss of hope, the joy that he must have felt in having his son actually being birthed forth upon the earth. I picture him and Sarah just, just crying out, imagining the goodness of God, the awe of God. How could this be? We're finally able to live the dream that I, I almost lost, that I almost let go of, that I didn't know if it would come to pass. And the child is born upon the earth. And then he, gets to, he begins to start to do all the things that he had dreamed about for 25 years with his son. His son is weaned, and, and then he begins to, to raise him up and love on him and teach him about God and God's ways and teach him the family business. And one year goes by, and another year goes by, and pretty soon his son is, is walking, and his son is feeding himself, and his son's beginning to help out in the fields, or whatever it might be that they did, and take care of, uh, of all of the animals. And his son is by his side. The son becomes a teenager, and he's growing into a, a young man, and at about 15 years old, God comes to Abraham and he says Abraham I want you to take your one and only son and I want you to sacrifice him now if you're a parent I want you to think about how you would feel in that moment you want me to sacrifice my child like it's bad enough to lose a child let alone have my hand involved in the loss to be the cause of the loss. You might ask, is this really you, God? How can this even be loving? It, this, is, this isn't even, why would you give me a son only to, to take away my son? If you're going to have me sacrifice, why spend 15 years of his life training him up and loving on him and having this dream only to take it away? You might, you might ask God how this is fair when you condemn it in all the other nations and you call upon those nations who sacrifice children as being evil, acts of evil, and yet this is what you would ask me to do? Like, is that, is that even loving? Are you really even a loving God? Why would you ask a parent to even be involved in such a thing? It, it just seems ludicrous. It seems dumb. It seems insane. Like, how could God ask somebody who loves their children so much to partake in the death of a child? If you have children, you know what I'm talking about. How could you do such a thing? And yet, it says in James chapter 2, that Abraham's faith was completed through his obedience. There was a lesson for, for Abraham, obviously. We often think of it as the test of Abraham's faith. It wasn't really a test of his faith for God because God knows all things. He knew Abraham's faith. He knew what was inside of him. But you know you can have all the faith in the world, but until you put it into action, it's never completed. In order for you to really have a complete faith, you have to put works to your faith. That's what James talks about. Like you can believe and say you believe all you want, but until you're living out what you believe, that faith is never completed. The only way to have a complete faith is to live out what you say you believe. And Abraham, in total surrender to God, was able to live out through obedience what he said he believed. And it wasn't a test for God to say, oh, now I know that you have faith in me. Really, it was to show Abraham his own faith. It was to show Abraham's son his faith. To show Abraham's family 
his faith, to show all of the people around them the faith, so that for generations to come, they would all see what a completed faith, absolute obedience looks like to God. So much so that thousands of years later, that we would look back upon this story and understand the big picture of the insanity that God requested of Abraham and how we would all question God because of it was a foreshadowing because he wanted us to have a greater understanding of his love for us. It all came back to why did Abraham ask, why did God ask Abraham to sacrifice his son? It was because of love. It was because of God's love for you. Because he wants you to fully grasp through hum humanity's experiences how much he loves you. And so he has Abraham potentially sacrifice his son Isaac so that when we would look back in history and see that God for, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, John 3.16, that we would have a greater understanding of what it took for God to have his own son sacrificed. You think in the story of Abraham and Isaac that it was absurd that a father would sacrifice his son. But God wants you to understand what your feelings were then is what he actually went through. What was stopped with Abraham and Isaac was not stopped when it came to God the Father and his own son. He went through with it, and that's how much he loves you and I. Imagine the pain, the loss, and the suffering that you would go through in having your own child sacrificed. And that's what he wants you to understand about his heart for you. And you know, here's the awesome thing about God is, is that in this story and in the story of, of his son Jesus Christ is that he wants to show us that it's not just about a completed faith or being obedient to him but that even when things look dead he will do things to show us that he still loves us in those dead situations you know I, I think about how the Bible says that Abraham was made righteous through his faith before the law was given to God's people, he was made righteous through his faith. What does that mean? Does that mean that because we saw how obedient was, he, he was made righteous? I want to add some understanding to that. Because nowadays, how are we made righteous? We're made righteous through our belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's through believing that Jesus came, he was sacrificed on the cross, that he died, and that he was resurrected from the grave. It's the belief in the resurrection that makes us righteous. Not by our works, lest any man should boast, right? But by what God did for us through the resurrection. And so when you go back to Abraham, really what made Abraham righteous was his belief in the resurrection thousands of years before it happened. Because when Abraham was going up the mountain with his son Isaac, he turned to his servants and he said, we will be back. Because he knew that when they left to sacrifice Isaac, which is a total foreshadowing, and Isaac carrying his own wood for his sacrifice, like Jesus carrying his own cross for his sacrifice, they get up there, and Isaac, by his own accord, is put down upon the altar, laying himself down. Abraham lifts the knife, and, and God stops him, and you know that in, in James and in Hebrews, it talks about his righteousness and what's attributed to him, and why it says that Abraham believed that had he went through with the sacrifice, that God would have still raised him from the dead, and that's why he could say, we will be back, because he believed in the resurrection power of God, that even when a situation looks completely dead in life, God loves humanity enough that he will bring life to dead situations. An amazing love for mankind. It's an incomprehensible love that he's continually trying to give to us, to show to us through stories upon the face of the earth. And yet, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, once again, 
that we may be able to comprehend that love, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. He wants us to know the unknowable, to, to comprehend the incomprehensible. Why? Because the more you know about God's love, the more you'll represent that love on the face of the earth. Like, really, it's always coming back to glorifying God. Always coming back to glorifying God with our actions. You know, I've, I've heard many a Christians talk about their, their love for God, but their lack of love for others. How they struggle with loving, loving other people. And that's totally like anti-Christian. Anti-Christ, if I may word it that way. Because it's always... When you understand the love of God, something that he wants us to display towards others. We're to love others like God loves us. And that's what it says, 1 John 4, 7 through 8. He writes, Beloved, let us love one another. Say, love one another. For love is of God, and everybody who loves is born of God and knows God. Everybody say, knows God. He who does not love does not know God. Do you think that, oh, like, he's talking about just, I don't love hot dogs, and I don't love mushrooms, and I don't love these, like, like, he's talking about if you lack in the ability to love other people, do you really know him? Because how much you know the love of God is always reflected in the way that you love other people. And if you struggle in loving other people, you struggle in understanding the love of God for you. Do you really know him? He who does not love God does not know God, for God is love. What he's wanting us to understand is that love isn't an option if you say that you believe in God. It's not an option. You would just love one another. Later on in that same chapter, chapter 4, verse 17, he says, Love has been perfected among us in this. Now listen, if love's been perfected among us, then love would also be perfected in us, so that love can be then be perfected through us. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. What would we need boldness for? To love. We need boldness to love. To accomplish everything God wants us to accomplish through love. Because as he is, so are we in this world. How is God? Because as he is, God is love. So as he is love, so are we in this world. What God's expectation of you and I, if we know God, is that we would be his love in this world. And so the challenge for us is to ask ourselves, when it comes to who we are and the people that surround us, do people view us as love? Are you really representing God's love? Because that's what he wants them to know. He doesn't want them to know necessarily his judgment, because John 3, 17 was that he didn't send God in, or Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but that through him they might be saved, right? It's not about condemn. Are you known for your condemning, or are you known for love? Ephesians 5, 2, And walk in love as Christ also has loved us. How has Christ loved us? Like that's a whole sermon in and of itself. And so just as Christ has loved us, he's saying now I want you to go out and walk in this world in that exact same love. Like the love that's being described in the Bible is a love that's out of this world. When it comes to this, this series, I think personally it'll be one of the most challenging series for people to hear. And it's not 
going to be because we're all being called a bunch of sinners and that we need to repent and that God has a wrath towards people who are full of sin and practicing that sin in their lives, that there's a place of eternal damnation, like all of that's true. But that's not why it's going to be challenged. I think the greatest challenge in studying the book of Hosea is that it shows us this incomprehensible love that God has for his people and that the challenge is that we would be able to love each other and love the world in the same way that God loves us. And so let's look at this love story from Hosea. Hosea chapter 1 verses 1 through 11. And we pray that this story challenges our hearts. It says this, the word of the Lord that came to Hosea the son of Beri in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. Like, he's, Hosea is, is setting the time frame for when he began his ministry. So just quickly to put this in context is that when it comes to the nation of Israel and the time frame that Hosea was a prophet, that you had the Israelites that came out of Egypt, they crossed over the Red Sea, they went to the Promised Land, they wandered for 40 years, they crossed over the River Jordan, they come into the Promised Land, and then in the Promised Land they become one nation and they serve under God, but that's not good enough for them, and so they want a king, and they request a king time after time after time, and s until God finally says, you know what, it's not what I want for you, but because you continue to ask, I'm going to give you what you want, but it's not going to be good for you. And so he gives them King Saul, and King Saul reigns over them in a harsh way, and King Saul's heart turns against God. And so God removes King Saul from the picture, and he places King David over his people. And King David is a person who is known as a man after God's own heart, and so he loves the Israelites, but he's far from a perfect person just because he has a heart after God, and he has sin in his life. And though God takes care of some of the situations that... Well, that, that came about because of his son, there's still always repercussions for sin, no matter how much you love God. And so God tells him that there is going to be issues within your family because of the sin that you have committed. And they will come to pass in the latter part of David's life. And that started to happen. And then Solomon, his son, takes the throne. And Solomon has a heart after God, and he serves God. And the nation of Israel is completely blessed and prosperous in all ways, and yet Solomon, his heart begins to turn against God because Solomon goes out and he decides that one wife's not good enough and two wives aren't good enough, three wives aren't good enough, but how about 700 wives and 300 concubines, whatever it was that, that he gains. And God told him, don't become unequally yoked from the very beginning. Like, don't marry somebody who's not of the same faith as you. You know, that's a New Testament scripture for Christians that we sometimes misunderstand. But if the wisest man in the world at the time, Solomon, can become unequally yoked and you see what happens in his life, what does that mean for us when we become unequally yoked? And so Solomon becomes unequally yoked and he allows the influence of the wives that worship other gods to bring those those beliefs into the nation of Israel, and Solomon allows the worship of other gods amongst the people, and so it influences the people, it influences the nation, and it eventually, it's influencing Solomon because he begins to do the same thing, and idolatry is rampant throughout Israel, and so again, God comes in Solomon's day, and he says that because of the sin that you have committed and allowed within the nation of people, this idolatry, this worship of somebody other than me, the one true God, then I am going to cause there to be repercussions of those sins, and this gathering of, of my followers will become divided. And so immediately after Solomon dies, it, one of his sons takes the throne, and it doesn't work out. There's a fight over the nation of Israel, and the nation of Israel is actually divided into two nations. You have the northern tribes, the northern kingdom, which are the ten tribes of Israel. You have the southern kingdom, which are only two tribes of Israel. And, and what you've got to see that in this picture is that God's heart is always, what God loves is being unified. That was his desire, that was his plan, it always has been. But sin will always bring division in life. 
anything that's divided in life is typically divided because of sin. A husband and wife who's divided, who separate, who divorce, whatever it might be, it's always because of sin. A father and a son, a mother and her daughter, children and their parents, when there's divisions within the family, it is always because of sin. When there's divisions within the church, it is always because of sin. When there's divisions within our nation, it is always because of sin. Because sin comes in to steal, kill, and to destroy unity that God desires. Because when we're unified, we are one unit and we love perfectly. And so the nation's been divided and kings come and go in both kingdoms. Some lead the people towards God, but most of them lead them away from God. And because they lead them away from God for 150 to 200 years, that God is sending in people called prophets to get the people of God who say they believe in God, who believe they still worship the one true God amongst all the other things they worship, to turn their hearts back towards God. And so Hosea comes upon the scene about 150 or 200 years into this, and he's in the northern kingdom, and the kingdom is very, very prosperous. Like there's nothing to worry about for the people. That's what he begins his ministry in. And when it comes to him stepping into ministry at this time frame, is that throughout the book of Hosea, it shows us that ultimately... Almost always, even for believers in God, that prosperity leads to apathy. Prosperity often leads to apathy. Because of your prosperity and your faith in believing that God has blessed you, then you become comfortable with where you are in life. Like, I just know God blessed me with this bigger house. I know that God blessed me with this this uh, you know nicer car that he's blessed me with me like everything is a blessing from God and we're all good when in reality you have sin in your life but you don't really have to face that sin because you're continually seeing blessings come into your life not knowing those blessings may be coming because of previous because of previous blessings that are continuing to flow from family from a nation of prosperity, from people who lived in righteousness. That's how the nation nation of Israel was prosperous. Not because any one of them people 150, 200 years down the road deserved it, but they were still living in the prosperity that ultimately came about during the time of Solomon. And they, they thought it was because of their own works, and so they got comfortable with where they are. And then in that prosperity and that comfort becomes a lackadaisical faith. Like you're lazy in your faith because there's no need for you to really have to extend faith. Just everything comes to you. And so life becomes pretty easy. Like I don't need to beg God for anything because God's already given me everything. I don't need to stretch my faith, to grow in faith. Like I already have it all and I'm, I just seem to be walking in, in those blessings. In reality, you're nothing but an apathetic person and you're losing faith because you're not growing in faith. You're not stretching your faith. And this is where Hosea has stepped into. And God has said, I want you to step into this nation and I want you to begin your ministry. And you're not just going to begin your ministry like every other prophet and think that you're going to just preach to everybody, that you're just going to write a book that everybody can read. But really what he's going to call Hosea to do is something that's incomprehensible. Something that's mind-blowing. To get the people to get out of their place of comfort and turn their hearts back towards God. And so what does he tell Hosea in chapter 2? Or in verse 2 he says, When the Lord began to speak to Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take yourself a wife. That's a good thing. But the next words are a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry. For the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. I want you to really understand, this is a people who thinks that they haven't departed from the Lord because they're so blessed. They still see God's blessing in their life. They think that everything's okay with them. And so God's trying to relate to them through another example in humanity. And he tells his prophet, from the very beginning of your ministry, this is what I want you to do. Take a wife. Take a wife. Why does he want him to take? 
Why is it so important for this example to take place? Because the greatest example of our relationship with God, the greatest earthly representation of a spiritual relationship with God is the covenant of marriage. The greatest example on earth of our spiritual relationship with God is the covenant of marriage. You see that in Deuteronomy when they first come to Mount Sinai. God makes a covenant with them. It's a marriage covenant. Throughout all of the Old Testament, he talks about them breaking that covenant. And he uses words that have everything to do with marriage. And then in the New Testament, you see Jesus is referred to as the groom and the church is referred to as the bride. It's so important for us to really understand God's desire for us and our relationship with him as individuals is that he wants a marriage relationship with you personally. And so this is what he's, he's telling Hosea, take, take a wife. But he's not just supposed to take a wife. He says, take a wife of harlotry and have children of harlotry. If you don't know what harlotry is, some translations word that as whoredom. He says, marry a whore and have children that come from the whore. A prostitute. Like, I don't know about you, but if you're wanting to step into ministry and God were to tell you that, would you not think this is crazy? This is, this is really insane. This is one of those Abraham Isaac stories. Like, this completely blows our mind. Like, why would you tell me to do this, God? Like, like you told Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. Like, not even there. I don't even understand. I don't grasp. Like, that's incomprehensible. And, and you tell Isaac, the prophet, to preach naked for three years throughout all the cities of the southern kingdom. Buck naked. Like, I don't, I, that's just incomprehensible because you love people so much you want to get their attention to what's going to happen to them years down the road when they get led out of the streets in captivity buck naked. And now you're telling me that I've got to marry a whore to start my ministry. Like, that is incomprehensible. What would your response be if God said to you to go out and marry a prostitute? Just think about that. Even if you're single, there's probably some aspect of, of desiring to be married at some time in your life. And God says, if you're going to get married, here's what I want you to do. Go find the nearest person that's selling themselves for money on the street and marry them. What would your response be? I, I don't know about you, but I'd be like... Phew. I'm no longer Pentecostal Church of God, but I think, I think I'm going to join Catholicism and I'll just be a priest, you know, because those guys have to stay single. Like, then he can't call me to marry a prostitute, right? You know, like, it, like God, you know, you know my heart. I've always wanted to be married, but I think that si single sounds pretty good. You know, like, I know this is what you desire, but, you know, they say a dog is a man's best friend. Me and Buddy, we'll do, you know. Right? Like, what would you, like, I, God, listen, I, I know that this is what you want, and you want me to do more than just preach to the people, but I will preach extra hard. Like, if that's what, I will preach extra, extra hard. Anything but, Lord, if it comes to writing the book that you want me to write so people can read it, like you thought Isaiah wrote a long book, I'll write twice as long of a book. I will throw romantic words in there, and I'll make it the Song of Solomon within the book of Hosea. I'll make, I'll make it something beautiful. But God, to marry, to start my ministry off, to marry a prostitute, right? Like, like can you even fathom what, what he could be thinking? And what would your response be if that's what God was calling you to do? And yet Hosea's response, we see in verse 3, it says, So he, Hosea, goes and takes Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Like that's a hint and a half right there that you're going to have issues. Not only did he tell you to marry a prostitute, but she's the daughter of Diblaim. <laughs> and now all the blame's going to come down on you. And the Lord says to him, when you have this son, call his name Jezreel. Jezreel means that God scatters. 
God scatters. For in a little while, I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu. So God's going to avenge some blood that has been shed. But if you know the story of Jehu, you'd think that that was a good story. Because Jehu, in the place called Jezreel, shed the blood of the 70 sons of Ahab, who were wicked and against God, to stop the lineage of King Ahab from ever moving forward in the nation of Israel again. And yet God is going to avenge that blood. He loves humanity so much that he doesn't really want blood to ever be shed. And yet there's a place where God calls that he will scatter his people because he says, and he will bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. It shall come to pass in that day that I will break the bow of Israel, which means its military power, in the valley of Jezreel. Like these people don't even really understand what God's saying here. The valley of Jezreel is the place where God scatters. And that he is about to bring his people, its military prowess, its power, what, what, it, what they put their faith in to this place where he's going to show them their faith is in the wrong thing. And because it's in the wrong places, I'm going to scatter it. I'm going to scatter it so far they don't even realize within a generation of the words that Hosea speaks, they will be extinct. The nation of Israel is in a great place of prosperity. Within 40 years, they'll be no longer. The 10 tribes will never return to the 10 tribes again. And again, this is about Hosea's relationship. So his son Jezreel represents judgment on sin and destruction to those who, who live in that, but never turn away from it. Jezreel really gives you the idea that it's the beginning of the end. You're brought to a place in your power. You're brought to a place in your faith where God will then scatter you because your power and your faith are in the wrong place. Being brought there is the beginning of your end. The birth of Jezreel is the beginning of the end. And maybe, maybe Hosea even knows that the birth of Jezreel because of his wife and what her actions are is the beginning of the end of their relationship. It's about to be cut off. And you'll see that in the next verse it says that she conceived again and she bore a daughter. Now notice it doesn't say like it said previously that she conceived and she bore Hosea a son. Hosea is left out of it this time. So... History, theologians throughout history tell us that it's quite possible that this daughter wasn't actually Hosea's daughter. It may have been and it was just left out, but it very well may not have been. It's questionable. And if you look at the context of what's being spoken, it's very questionable. Because it says, Then God said to him, Call her name lo Rahama, which means no mercy. For I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. No mercy. The daughter's name means no mercy. Like he's come to a place finally where like, there's no mercy left. And in, in respect to the relationship, that it's possible that he has no mercy, no compassion left for Gomer because of the lifestyle that she continues to live. Possibly for the daughter that he birthed forth that maybe isn't even his daughter. He, maybe he doesn't even know if, his, if it's his daughter. And here's, here's the deal. When it comes to this loss of compassion, you know that loss of compassion is still love. You're losing compassion. But oftentimes that place of no mercy is still an act of love. In verse 7, he says, Yet I'll have mercy on the house of Judah. So he wants to, uh, them to understand, here's why this is happening. I know that you all say you believe in me, but I want you to look at these other people, the house of Judah, and I'm going to save them by the Lord their God. And I'll save them not by bow, nor by sword, nor battle, nor by horses, nor by horsemen. So he's bringing in an example. These people also say they believe in me. And you know what's going to happen to you isn't going to happen to them because they still worship the one true God. Look at them and the way they live their lives. So he's showing them the way their, their brothers and sisters actually still worship him. He goes on in verse 8 and it says that now when she had weaned lo Ruhama and conceived and bore a son. Again it doesn't mention that she conceived a son for Hosea. 
So it's questionable whether this third, whether this third child is his again. But verse 9 says that God said to call his name Loami, which means not my kin, not of my people, not of my blood. And then God says to them, for you are not my people and I will not be your God. Can you imagine that, that it comes to that place? There's this progression that God wants people to see in the naming of Hosea's children from judgment to no mercy to no relationship. Understand that judgment, punishment, correction, uh, even though it may look bad, God has warned his people for 200 years that this is coming. He's given them chance after chance after chance to turn their hearts back towards him, to get things straightened out. But still, correction is always done from a place of love. Like he's not correcting them because he's being mean. He's bringing correction into their lives to, to ultimately get them to turn their hearts back towards him. It reminds me of Paul telling the church in Corinth, like, you know that man that's been living in sexual immorality amongst all of you, and you allow him to still come to your church? Kick him out that his flesh might be destroyed, that his soul will be saved. Like, the idea isn't that, you know, he'd be kicked out of the church because we don't like him and we don't like what he's doing, but ultimately that that is a thing that, that comes from a place of love because you want to see their heart come back towards God. That's truly compassion. But then it comes to a place where, you know what, you've, you've, talked, you've talked somebody's ear off and you can't talk anymore and you, you've ran out of a place of correction. They don't listen to you anymore. They continue. And, and if you are real with yourself, more than likely when somebody's continued to do the things that you've asked them not to do towards you and they continue time after time after time, you begin to lose compassion for those people. It begins to wane. Like, I'm tired of this. You continue to do that. And so God's saying there's no mercy. But what I want you to understand that in the fact that there's no mercy doesn't mean there's no love. If you're like me, and I'm, I'm just real, like when people get to that place and you've tried and you've tried and you've tried, then finally sometimes you're just like, you know what? They deserve what they get. There's no mercy or no compassion left. You deserve what you get. But the reality is, even that comes from a place of love. Because ultimately, in the act of no mercy, hopefully, in the consequences that they reap, they will still come back to God. And then finally, when they continue, time after time, God says, no relationship. But here's the thing that I want us to really see in this picture, and we'll get into later as we go through this story, is that God isn't the one that stops the relationship. It isn't him that put the stop to it. Like, we may want to blame him because that's what he says, but ultimately the reality is when people are in that place of sin in their lives... And they've been warned and they've been talked to and they've gotten to a place where they continue to walk away and you've even lost compassion and they're reaping the consequences. They continue to walk through those consequences, committing the same acts that they've always committed that they are the ones that put the stop to the relationship. Like we may think that God has all of a sudden become loveless towards his people. That's not true at all. Like they've walked away from him. And he's given them more chances than they deserve. You see this time after time in the church. There's many of you that probably know other people that, you know, they've been in church. They say they believed in God. And then they start to get caught up in sin. And you try to talk to them and bring them back. And you try to explain to them, man, just come back to God. He loves you. All these, these things. And then maybe even there's correction brought in their life. Hey, you know what? You need to straighten up. You need to do this. And, and there's a little bit more of truth and love. And then eventually it's less love, a little less compassion, a little less mercy. You're still trying to bring them truth. And, and eventually eventually, you know, they get to that place where they're just continuing to go their own way, and so you no longer do you treat them as the brother and sister, but as the Bible says, you treat them as if they are of the world, and, and, you've, and, and that isn't necessarily there, but you know what? You still ultimately love them 
You love them, but they walk away from you. They walk away from God. They walk away from the church family because they, they've gotten to that place where they don't want to be any, near anything or anyone that might bring that conviction back into their lives. They're the ones that cut it off. And this is, is the description of what God wants Hosea to do. And as crazy as it sounds, what's just as crazy is the fact that Hosea was obedient to every aspect of it. He was faithful when everything around him was unfaithful. He was loving when everyone around him was unloving. Like, like the whole idea that he stayed faithful in a seemingly impossible dead situation is incomprehensible love. I want to just really drill this into you real quick. Imagine God tells you to take a spouse who has been with many other people. With many other people. I'm not just talking about somebody who's, you know, been the town tramp. Somebody who's slept around. Somebody who's been a part of today's culture. I'm talking about somebody who has sold themselves for money. Somebody that's what they know and that's what they're okay with. I want you to imagine what it would be like for God to tell you to take somebody who you know if you understand the spiritual principle of soul ties that this person is more than likely messed up. They have, they have a past that precedes prostitution. Because you know that nobody, no young girl wakes up one day at five years old and dances around and says, Mommy and Daddy, I want to be a prostitute when I grow up. That's nobody's dream. That's no one's desire. They don't want to choose that. But you know that more than likely they had some sort of abuse in their lives. Maybe they didn't have a father. Maybe they had an abusive father. Maybe they were sexually abused by somebody else. Maybe, you know what, they, they were taken into sex slavery, whatever it might be. There was some sort of sin that brought great damage inside of them, that brought them to this place of worthlessness in life, that they think that there's nothing better for them, that they're not worthy of anything else to position themselves to be able to sell themselves for money. They have a past, a broken past. They've got emotional hurt. They've got junk in their life that they, they need to get rid of. Imagine that they have all these issues. They, they know that sex is money, that sex sells, but do they know what love is? Imagine taking a spouse that you know has not only been unfaithful to God and to everybody in the world and caused other people to be unfaithful by getting with that person, but that they could possibly be unfaithful to you. What is being asked here is a dangerous love. Dangerous. And then think about this. This guy is just beginning his ministry as a young man. In his culture, he is probably well-known and well-respected. Doesn't necessarily mean he's well-liked if he's preaching the truth of God. Nevertheless, he is well-respected and well-known. And if you want anybody to listen to the ministry that you are going to have, this would not be the way to start your ministry. Imagine the gossip that would take place about Hosea and his wife. The lies that would even be spoken based upon the past truths. Imagine the ridicule that he would have to face being a man of God, pure before the Lord, walking out righteousness before all the people, and yet knowing that his wife could be with other people on the side. Imagine what he would have to endure bringing kids into the mess. I mean, I think about Hosea's hopes and dreams that he being righteous before the Lord, remaining a virgin 
that's now looked at as garbage in our world. Junk that somebody has to deal with. But he's a virgin stepping into his ministry, looking for a wife that more than likely he would want to be equally yoked with. Looking for a wife that's remained pure like he has remained pure. Looking for a wife that would love him and support him in the challenges of ministry. That would partner with him. That they might accomplish great things for the kingdom of God and accomplishing God's will upon the earth. Looking for a wife that they could have many children with and be fruitful in their society and their culture. That they would have the white picket fence and they would have the beautiful home and that they would have this great ministry that would go forth from it and something that they could pass pass on to their children, that they would have this great life together. Imagine the hopes and the dreams of the man of God as he steps into ministry when God says, I want you to marry a harlot and have children of harlotry. Shattered dreams. A broken heart. Great hurt. Deep sorrow. Is that fair? Isn't that often a question in our world? How fair is that that God wouldn't allow me to marry the person I want to marry? And as a continual reminder of the hurt, the sorrow, the betrayal, the shattered dreams, now he has three children that will continually remind him of all that he's been through, two of which may not even be his own. That he, because his wife does her own thing, is the one that's left to take care of the home, to take care of the ministry, and to take care of children that possibly aren't even his. I mean, the whole story is just completely unhinged. It seems incredulous, and yet this is the whole point. Because the big picture behind the story, which is an example through humanity to us, is that God is Hosea. And you and I are Gomer. That incredible, indescribable, unmeasurable love. And, and God just really wants us to understand that this whole saying that we believe in God and yet we can continue to sin like it's no big deal isn't just about breaking some rules that were put in a book or, or you know, some, some law that came through the Bible and that if we sin, we just ask for forgiveness. So it's, it's so much deeper than that when you understand that the relationship God wants with you is a marriage covenant with you. That's why James 4.4, 4, James, the brother of Jesus, is talking to the church, not to the world, but to the church. And he says, adulterers, adulteresses. Like this is to the church. This is to those who say they believe in God. This is to those who are supposed to be living it out and loving others. And he calls them a bunch of adulterers. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world, if you want that stuff of the world, if you want the things of the world, you want the pleasures of the world, you don't want to make this thing seriously about me, make all of life about me. If that's not what you want, you want those things of the world, that's fine, but you have made yourself an enemy of God. Oh, but I believe in God. No, James is talking to those that say they believe in God, but I worship God. No, James is talking to those who say that they worship God. Just as Hosea was to the Israelites, those who would say that they worship God. Oh, but God still blesses me. Oh yeah, but he's blessing you with the things of the world that you've now found comfort in and that you've become lackadaisical in your faith about. He calls them adulterers and adulteresses. James is talking to Christians who don't want to give this up, not because it's just sin or idolatry, but he calls it adultery. Like what's the greatest betrayal in your marriage? Adultery. 
It's the one reason that God would give us to divorce our spouse. The one reason, he says, you can, have, you can gain a divorce is through adultery. It's that serious, that big of a deal. And that's what he calls sin against him, is adultery. Think about this. And the fact that God wants a, a personal, intimate relationship, the marriage relationship with you. You, who more than likely has some sort of past. You've had some sort of brokenness. You've been betrayed. You've also betrayed others. You who might have soul ties because of your connections to things in this world. You who might have emotional issues. You who might have uh, the idea that you understand the culture of love in our country is really understand maybe even within the church the concept of loving loving each other as a family and making family a priority but do you understand biblical love for one another you who because of your past could return to your past the bible says it's like a dog that returns to his vomit and yet so many people will return to their past sins God desires this intimate relationship with you who could be unfaithful and imagine the ridicule that we bring upon our God when we don't reflect the love that he has for us towards the world around us. Imagine the hurt and the sorrow that he has to endure because of our unfaithfulness towards him and yet to think that he chose us as we are that's the story of Hosea that God would call Hosea to choose a bride as she was to choose a bride knowing that she's unfaithful and yet Romans 5 8 says but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, the ultimate price of love was shown to us through Christ dying for us. Incomprehensible love. You know that Hosea means salvation and Gomer means complete. And as we look throughout this story, what we'll see is that Gomer, though she is broken, she is far from perfect, she still has issues, she continues to betray and be unfaithful, that because God's love is unbroken, she will become healed, made whole, and be complete. And that's God's love for us. That even though we may break his heart, he holds on to an unbroken love. That will eventually make us complete. We are completed through God's love for us. That's what Paul said in Ephesians 3.19. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That you would become complete through that knowledge of love. is that we will know God's love through this story in a way that we've never known before. But I also know the greatest challenge will be for us to understand that though we have been broken by people around us, we've had people be unfaithful to us. We've had people hurt us, betray us, do the worst of the worst to us, that even in our brokenness, God's still calling us us to show them an unbroken love that we would love others